Today, I'm going to expand on the concept of biological apostasy. Essential to throwing off the mantle of goddess worship is the ability for you as an individual to choose, and here is where determinism comes into play. It is thus critical that determinism is sufficiently defined, and even more critical, that it is distinguished from fatalism, which is a very different animal indeed. The distinction between determinism and fatalism is all the more important because one of the criticisms you will often hear is that we are in fact part-time fatalists, believing that women are forever trapped in one form of comportment with men being uniquely endowed with the ability to diverge from rigid behavioral patterns. Of course, neither claim is true, and to understand this we require a fuller understanding of what it means to be a biological determinist and how this is distinguishable from any form of fatalism. As to begin with, a simple example will serve to illustrate the difference between the deterministic worldview and the fatalistic worldview. Imagine a man comfortably sitting in his living room in his flat on a Sunday afternoon. Suddenly, there is a news announcement. Geophysicists have arrived at the conclusion that, within a fortnight, a Richter scale 9.5 earthquake will level the entire area of the city he lives in. Let us assume, for the sake of argument, that in case A, the man lives in a fatalistic universe. He hears the announcement, it passes through his ears, and he goes about his business as if nothing had happened. On Monday, he goes to work as usual, and his routine remains the same until the fortnight is up, upon which his home is leveled to the ground, and he dies in the collapse. Now, this does not seem remarkable in and of itself, but in fact, it is quite remarkable. What's off in the picture? This is an accurate depiction of a fatalistic worldview, one in which cause and effect and the human element of reactivity to that cause and effect simply do not exist. The man is effectively bound to his routine, and there is no escape from it. His impending doom, ushered in by an earthquake, has no meaning in this context, since he lacks responsiveness, he lacks reactivity. All he has is routine and forward motion within that routine. Of course, anyone with a brain knows that this is not how the world actually works the patent falsehood of such a scenario, which leads us to case B. The same man hears the message and immediately jumps out of his couch, remembering that his brother has a spare room in his house on the opposite end of the country, calls him, makes arrangements to temporarily move in with him, and does not go to work on Monday, but instead calls in sick, packs his bags, by Wednesday he's on a plane, and by Thursday he's already moved in with his brother. The fortnight is up, his home and city is leveled to the ground, but he is thousands of kilometers away and thus escapes unscathed. It is case B, not case A, that should instantly come to mind as the far more familiar, never mind likely scenario, where A represents fatalism and B represents determinism. In fact, to the attentive mind, the fatalistic depiction is completely absurd because virtually no human being acts in this manner. Determinism is thus a model of behavior which is rooted in the reactivity of individuals to external stimuli. Biological determinism is simply an extension of that model, taking into account the biological urges and drives will serve as the primary engine of reaction to those stimuli. When we speak of the biological, we are speaking of two governing forces of biology, namely survival and reproduction, in that order though the two often co coincide and can sometimes be considered the same, depending on the context. Human behavior, be it male or female, will thus be limited by those two forces. We have overarching tendencies, innate tendencies if you will, that spring forth from the survival and reproductive drive, and we also possess a certain degree of flexibility to react within that context. The power of reactivity, however, must be incentivized, and it can only be incentivized if either the goal of survival success or reproductive success can be furthered. In the aforementioned examples, it seems simple because it is simple. The man was facing threat of death by earthquake and took appropriate measures to preserve his life. But in the context of the more complex and sometimes more subtle case of social and biological interaction with women, that simplicity fades. Part of the problem when it comes to male-female relations is the ability to react to potential threats is curtailed by conflicting interests. Men are saddled by millions of years of biology and endowed with an instinct to protect women for themselves, even to the point when it is harmful to themselves. So let us take a more complex example. 
the man at the end of a divorce is still in a state of shock because he is losing property and assets, and the woman that allegedly loves him now hates him, and he can no longer see his children. This is no longer simply a matter of fight or flight, and his instincts to please the female in such a case are actually being less helpful to his survival. He is confused. In an even more extreme example, the same can be said of a male who, while being stabbed to death by a woman, does not lift a finger in his own defense. Conditioning, call it what you will. So the ability to effectively react to external stimuli, to redetermine one's own path, can be hampered when the issue is not one of obvious life or death, or in the case of the stabbing, it is. And it becomes still more muddled when reproductive drive is taken into account. A man who has taken the time and energy to think through the possible dangers posed to him in the current atmosphere, redirecting his energy to other, more beneficial avenues than chasing women and reproducing at all costs, is essentially doing exactly what the man threatened by the earthquake has done. His chances at survival have been reduced, which in modern terms can be equated with the quality of life. His actions are determined by the external stimuli he receives as well as the reactions to those stimuli. There's nothing fatalistic about it. And yet MGTO and others who adhere to a worldview of biological determinism are often incorrectly labeled fatalists by people who far more resemble fatalists than they do. PUAs and tradcons alike far more resemble fatalists than do men going their own way. Who more resembles the fatalist? The man who apishly repeats the hackneyed phrase of real man issuing forth grunts of the need to breed, all the while genuflecting and rapt devotion to the goddess who is his mistress, or the man who defines himself on his own terms. Who is a slave to his nature, the man who loudly proclaims that man must compete and die for the affections of womankind because it is, quote, how it was always done, end quote, or the man who chooses to do what he does and does not bend knee to either goddess or nature? Are you beginning to see it is such men who do not believe we can determine what we do with our lives, and that we are hopelessly bound to the whims of nature and our drives that are de facto fatalists. But ability to change and re redirect one's life is not the same as the likelihood that one actually does so. They are separate issues. Redirected behavior must be incentivized, but where there is no incentive, and in this case I'm speaking of women, or the incentives are clouded or muddled by a mass of counterproductive and counterintuitive instinctive drives, and here I'm speaking of men, that is where we begin to feel that human behavior is indeed fatalistic, even when it is clearly not. Remember, it is those people who believe we must do as all others do, or have always done, that most closely resemble fatalists in outlook and approach. Most people, for a variety of reasons, do not possess the faculties required to overcome base drives, even when they are harmful. But the more salient point here is that either way, a redirection of behavioral patterns as a response to external circumstances must be incentivized, and it is here where we run into difficulties. Men are now increasingly in a position to observe a marked disadvantage to their survival, i.e. quality of life, and still more in their reproductive chances, and this is a turning point for them. The disadvantages are becoming so glaringly apparent that some men are waking up to them and turning their backs on them. And this is what biological determinism is, the flexibility to work within a framework of prescriptive behaviors which can be shed if the incentive is great enough. Some men can recognize this, and these are thinking men. Most men cannot. But what of women? That is the question, and is directly related to the issue of equality and equality under the law. As mentioned just prior, women by and large have little to no incentive to change their behavior because neither their survival, nor their reproductive rights, nor reproductive chances for that matter, have been adversely affected. Without an incentive, neither male nor female will move outside of prescriptive behavioral patterns. What I'm attempting to demonstrate here, though, is that the human female simply has no reason whatsoever to change her behavior, and certainly not to take a hit and reduction in quality of life and the diverse opportunities afforded to her by modernity. It is not that she cannot, but rather that there is simply no reason to do so. This is why it is highly unlikely, to near impossible, that women will accept the premise that they should enjoy equality under the law, or equality of any sort, when it is of no benefit to them, neither to their survival or reproduction. 
especially because it would mean a net reduction in their quality of life. Simply put, things would be worse than better. If circumstances changed, this too might change as well. But there's no real light at the end of the tunnel we currently find ourselves in, and no trends that are promising enough to prophesize otherwise. It is thus only men in this era who will be receptive to the circumstances they find themselves in, and even then it would only be a small number. The thinking men, with others continuing to follow the trend of behavioral patterns that have become destructive in the modern context. The thinking man is the biological apostate. He has shorn off the mandates nature has set upon him and moved forward into uncharted territory, unbound and free to do as he pleases.